Citizen Kane has been lauded by the American Film Institute as the greatest motion picture ever to be made in America. It also represents, of course, the pinnacle of Orson Welles' filmmaking career and remains infinitely watchable. For although Welles lived for more than 40 years following the release of Kane, he never succeeded in recapturing the brilliance or fulfilling the promise of his first feature. As Damien Cannon has pointed out, the film has a unified vision resulting from the combination of two factors. First, Wells was given absolute control over his creation. Second, by using many of his beloved Mercury players, Wells knew in advance that he was directing a stellar cast. The script for Citizen Kane, written by Herman Mankiewicz, with an assist from Wells, is a thinly disguised fictional biography of publishing king William Randolph Hearst. And while Hearst was offended by Wells' characterization of him, he was supposedly more angered by Kane's unflattering portrayal of his beloved mistress, Marion Davies. Back in 1941, Hearst exerted his considerable power and influence to destroy Citizen Kane before it opened. He failed, but Wells' young career, he was only 25 at the time, did not escape unscathed. A smear campaign in Hearst newspapers branded him as a communist. Kane, nominated for nine Oscars, emerged with only one, best screenplay, and boos could be heard whenever the film was mentioned during the ceremony. The studio took control of the next film, The Magnificent Ambersons, slashing more than 40 minutes of footage. As a film, Citizen Kane is a powerful, dramatic tale about the uses and abuses of wealth and power. It's a classic American tragedy about a man of great passion, vision, and greed, who pushes himself until he brings ruin to himself and all around him. Within moments of the film's eerie, visually stunning opening, Kane is dead, uttering as his last word, Rosebud. His death, like his life, is a big news event, and the paper he owned, the New York Inquirer, is desperate to unearth the meaning of his cryptic last word. Is it a beloved pet? A horse that he bet on? A woman? The truth, which isn't revealed until the closing scene, represents one of the all-time greatest motion picture ironies. And compromising, unsentimental drama of this sort was not in vogue during an era that was better known for titles like The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. The most memorable aspect of Citizen Kane is Greg Toland's landmark cinematography. The movie is a visual masterpiece, a kaleidoscope of daring angles, and breathtaking images that had never been attempted before and has never been equaled since. Toland perfected a deep focus technique that allowed him to photograph backgrounds with as much clarity as foregrounds. As Cannon notes, the dialogue, sometimes first person and sometimes voiceover, is witty, believable, clever, and well-structured. Sentences tend to overlap as people argue and struggle to get their points across, just like in real life. On the soundtrack side, Bernard Herrmann wrote his score on the spot while scenes were being shot. Needless to say, the dialogue and music mesh beautifully. Wells produced other artistic masterpieces like Othello and A Touch of Evil, but one could argue that like the Cain character in his film, Wells' adult life was marked by a slow but inevitable descent into isolation. After the magnificent Ambersons, he became toxic to Hollywood. Like Citizen Kane, he was a vital, passionate figure in his youth, but a sad, pathetic one at the end, doing bit parts and commercials in order to finance fragments of filming projects. To quote Cannon again, it is one of the miracles of cinema that in 1941 a first-time director, a cynical, hard-drinking writer, an innovative cinematographer, and a group of New York stage and radio actors were given the keys to a studio and total control, making a stunning masterpiece.